go ahead and assume you were thinking that. Well, if, if this picture was made today, uh, first of all, it would be uh, a half an hour longer. And uh, the last half hour would be a meaningless battle between Tom and the Klopek hanging on a girder from a helicopter over Universal City. Because that's the way you have to make movies. Now, you can't make movies with one ending. You've got to have movies with 12 endings. And, and, and all these big blockbuster movies, which I'm not knocking them, and they're, they're fine. But when you, when you get to the last third of the movie, when you really want to wrap up the story, and okay, what's going to happen? They give you more special effects and more explosions and more fights and more battles and all that kind of stuff. And you know, it's really boring. Well, um, watching this film, it really does feel like a Joe Dante film, uh, particularly for me, the dream sequence. It kind of has that, uh, that awesome like Tex Avery, Looney Tunes kind of energy to it. Um, so given what you said that you'd made some changes to the script and the story, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how you molded this story into something that was your own. Well, you know, I mean, when, when, I, when I get hired to make a movie, I, I can't make movies that I wouldn't go see. And so uh, everything that I get, once it's handed to me, sort of goes through the filter. And uh, what comes out the other end is, has been up to now more or less a Joe Dante movie. And um, I can't quite explain how that works, but there is a certain consistency to the movies. I mean, I'm a big cartoon fan, so the, the movies are often very cartoon-like. Um, and I'm a big Mad Magazine fan, so they're very satirical. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I like fantasy movies, and so there's always a, an element somewhere, whether it deserves to be in there or not, of a, a fa of fantasy, like this one has a dream sequence in it. Uh, which, had, which was actually, <laughs> no, I'm not comparing it to the one in Spellbound, but it used to be uh, longer. And um, I had some pretty cool things in it, but it really did sort of stop the story, so we had to take them out. In terms of the cast, I mean, you have an amazing cast in this film. Uh, like Bruce Dern, Carrie Fisher, and of course Tom Hanks, who sort of blew up as this film was being made because Big had come out and it, that was... Actually, no, Big hadn't come out. He, it, he, had, he had made it. And I remember him leaving the set early one day to go to the premiere of Big. So it didn't actually open until uh, while we were shooting. And um, it, it was a, a big career change uh, for Tom. But well, interestingly, uh, Tom was reluctant to do the movie because it was the first movie in which he would play a dad. And I think, you know, having been a leading man and been doing all these parts as the young hero, I think he was starting to sense that if he plays a father, uh, it's a career change. And it means he's now going to be, you know, playing family men and he's not going to be able to make those hip comedies that he likes and, and he can't do Splash anymore. And, uh, and so he really had to convince him. And he, I, I, all, all during the pre-production, he would always say, does, does he have to have a kid? I mean, does he really have to, does he have, to have a kid? But, you know, he, he, he rolled along with it, and, and, and uh, I, I think it's one of the better pictures he made around that period. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, his speeches, his monologues, and his epic free coats alone are amazing. Um, and I remember seeing it as a kid, and it was, I think it was the first time I had seen Carrie Fisher outside of Star Wars, and it kind of upset me a bit. I was like... Because she didn't, she didn't have a big crawler on her head? <laughs> yeah, she was like, she's like my mom. What the, that's not right. Um, <laughs> but uh, I also heard another story from Courtney again, uh, that she kind of gave you a makeover one day on set. She did. I was, I was very unkempt. Uh, I, I wouldn't say to the Tim Burton level, but I was, I was, <laughs> I was pretty unkempt. And uh, Carrie took it upon herself to, um, to give me the makeover, and she took me to this very expensive hair cutter guy, and I got different clothes, and there's photos of me on the set of this movie that I look, and I go, is that really me? I mean, because I just look completely different. Uh, but she was great, and um, I, I, I couldn't think of anybody who, to be better in that part because she and Tom had this rapport that allowed them to ad lib uh, stuff that was just far beyond anything that was actually in the script, and uh, not all of which made it into the movie, but a lot of it did. And all of that stuff with them watching game shows and stuff, I mean, that's just purely them just goofing. And they got along great, and, and, and the, you could see the chemistry. I want to throw it open to the audience in a moment, uh, but before we get there, just to make sure we, we cover this ground, because it's important, um, why sardines and pretzels? Where does that come from? <laughs> well, 
sardines revolt me. I never liked sardines. And um, pretzels, I could take or leave. But, but sardines, I mean, give me a break. I mean, you actually eat, this, eat the whole fish, the bones, the whole thing. Ugh. I never liked fish because my mom used to make me uh, Mrs. Paul's fish sticks when I was a kid. And I thought all fish tasted like that. So it wasn't until years later when I actually went to England and got some real fish that I thought, oh, this isn't even the same stuff. Uh, but the, but the, the, uh, that scene was hilarious to shoot because it, it was to try to keep a straight face during, now of course, Brother Theodore keeps a straight face no matter what happens. It was partly because he was almost completely deaf and he could, all, he could very seldom hear the cues that the other actors were giving him and so he was always able to remain in character. It works though and that was his last film. And uh, he was a very interesting character. I don't know if anyone had caught him on Letterman back in the day. He was a regular guest on Letterman, but uh, he was also a Holocaust survivor. Yeah, he had quite a quite a, a a grim past, which he turned into a sort of a performance art thing that he used to do in New York and occasionally on television. And it was very dark, macabre stuff. And uh, but in in real life, he was not like that at all. He was just a really sweet guy, and so happy to be on the movie. Um, and we had a minder for him because he was, you know, a little old. And this the kid was, I think, like maybe 17 or 18. And uh, he would just tell this kid all about his life and the things that had happened to him. And the kid would come out of the trailer all white and, and look <laughs> pale. And he'd like, he just had never been exposed to that level. Of, you know. Let's take some questions from you guys.